let's talk about how to take the average of two random variables. The first thing we need to remember is that if we just want a single average, we're really talking about a function of two random variables that we're trying to average. So with the joint PMF or joint PDF, we have a full characterization of a pair of random variables. We know how likely it is that they take a certain pair of values together, but we might just want to know how they behave on average. So we might select some function, right? And we might be interested in just knowing what's the average value of that function with respect to the PMF or PDF. So let's say our function is w, which is equal to some g of x comma y, right? And so the naive approach is to just first determine the distribution of w, okay? So we look at the joint PMF or PDF, and we try to work out what the PMF or PDF of w is, and then calculate the average of w. But this can be pretty hard, right? So this uh, process of determining the PMF or PDF of w can be quite challenging, and we actually don't need to do this, okay? So we can just skip this step entirely. What we can do instead is just directly compute the average of w or the function using the joint PMF or PDF. So the expected value of a function, g of x, y, is in the discrete case. It's just the sum of that function weighted by the joint PMF summed up over all the values in the range. Okay, so just the weighted average of that function with respect to the joint PMF. In the continuous case, it's the same thing, but now I just replace the sums with integrals. I have my function, my joint PDF, and I take the integral of dx dy. Okay, so as before, I have the linearity of expectation. So for any functions, uh, let's say g1 up to gn, so I have n different functions, and I have some constants, a1 up to an. And what I want to do, let's say, is sum up these functions weighted by these constants and then take the average. Well, I can break that up and into the individual averages of these functions, again, weighted by these constants. This is a generalization of this idea of linearity of expectation that we've seen before. Why does it work? Well, when I'm taking the expectation, all I'm doing is summing up in the discrete case. And so if I'm summing up a sum, I can break up that sum, and I'm just left with a bunch of individual averages. Okay, so there's nothing wrong with splitting uh, these summations across these plus signs, and then I'm just left with what I had on the right-hand side. So this is easy to check, and in the continuous case, I would just replace the sums with integrals, and I would get the same idea. The special cases you might see is that the expectation of the sum is just the sum of the expectations, and if I weight it and add a constant, same thing, I have ax uh, plus by plus c. If I take the average, that's the same as the average of a times e of x plus b times e of y plus c. Okay, and the key thing to remember with all of this is that you can always use the linearity of expectation. There's nothing to check, okay? You can just apply it. In particular, you do not need to check that independence holds between x and y, right? So um, there are properties where you have to check independence before proceeding, but linearity of expectation is not one of those. Okay, well, here's one of them. Let's say you have a product of functions and you want to take the average. So expectation of products. Here, if I have independence, then I can factor the product. Okay, so let's say I have functions gx and hy, and I take the average of gx times hy. I can write that as the average of gx times the average of hy, so long as they're independent. The reason is that when I go to write down this um, average of the function, I have the joint PMF in the discrete case, and due to independence, I can just factor that joint PMF into the marginal PMFs, the product of the marginal PMFs, and then I can just reorganize the sum, and I see that I have the two expectations just sitting there. Okay, so simple enough. Um, so the caveats in this case, so okay, yeah, you can do it for the continuous case, and the caveats are that really this doesn't work if you have dependent x and y in general. It might work, right? So you might be able to find an example where it does work, but that doesn't mean that it's going to hold uh, beyond that, okay? So you might find a specific example where this actually works, but there's no guarantee that that means that the variables are independent. They could still be dependent. Okay, so let's work through an example now. 
So in this table, I've listed a joint PMF, and I'm going to try to work out the expected value of y squared. Okay, so one thing I can do is I can just work with this uh, joint PMF directly. So let's get to work. So I can just write e of y squared is the sum over x and the sum over y. y squared, that's my function, p of x, y, and that's my joint PMF. So now I just have to go table by table entry. For the first entry, you have minus y, minus 1 squared. That's going to have three entries that correspond to y equals minus 1. And so I'm going to write those out. So I have the joint PMF at minus 1, minus 1, plus 1, minus 1, and plus 2, minus 1. Same for y equals plus 2. I have minus 1, plus 2, plus 1, plus 2, and plus 2, plus 2. Okay? So I just, those are my weights, and I multiply those by the function I want, which is y squared. So I'm going to get um, a third plus a twelfth, plus four times a sixth plus a fourth plus the sixth, right? And that's going to end up being all over twelve. Four plus one plus eight plus twelve plus eight, all divided by twelve. So I get 33 over 12, which is going to be 11 over four. Okay, and I want to double check that this makes sense. So what I'm going to do is first calculate the marginal PMF of y by adding up the entries of the rows. And so I'm going to get that the um, probability that y is equal to minus 1 is 5 twelfths and that it's equal to uh, plus 2 is 7 twelfths. Okay, so now that I have the marginal PMF of y, I can use my um, standard procedure for calculating e of y squared. So I'm going to double check that this a new process of calculating via the joint PMF also works. And so I'm going to compute using the marginal. So e of y squared is the sum over y, y squared times the marginal PMF of y. So that's going to be minus 1 squared times 5 twelfths plus plus 2 squared times 7 twelfths. That works out to be 5 over 12 plus 28 over 12. That's 33 over 12, which matches. It's 11 over 4, which matches. Okay, so I'm done. Both ways work, whichever one you prefer. In the same example, let's calculate e x squared y. Okay, so this is going to be a different uh, function. So, but I'm going to follow the same process. I'm just going to write the sum over x and then the sum over y. x squared times y times the joint PMF. So I have to just go entry by entry. I'm going to get minus 1 squared times minus 1. And then I multiply by the PM, joint PMF at minus 1, minus 1. Then plus 1 squared times minus 1. Joint PMF at plus 1, minus 1. Plus 2 squared times minus 1. Joint PMF again at plus 2, minus 1. So that's the um, first row. Now I'm going to go to the second row. I'm going to have minus 1 squared times uh, plus 2. And I'm going to have um, plus 1 squared times plus 2. And then finally, I'm going to have uh, plus 2 squared times plus 2, all times their respective joint PMF values. OK, and if I just plug in those values from the table, I'm going to get um, minus 1 times a third plus minus 1 times 0 plus minus 4 times a twelfth plus plus 2 times a sixth plus plus 2 times a fourth, plus plus 8 times a sixth. Okay, and so then all of that over 12 is going to work out to be um, minus 4, minus 4, plus 4, plus 6, plus 16 over 12, and that's going to be 18 over 12, okay, which is just 3 halves. All right, and finally, let's say what I want to calculate is uh, the expectation of 4x squared y minus y squared. At this point, I should recognize that I've done both of these parts uh, separately, and I can use linearity of expectation, right? So this is the same as 4 e of x squared y minus e of y squared, and those are the two components I've already worked out. Okay, so linearity of expectation allows me to split this across the minus sign as well as pull out the 4. And then I can just plug in those values. I just worked out that the 
first term is 3 halves, and on the previous slide I worked out that it was 11 fourths, so it's 24 minus 11 over 4, which is just 13 over 4. Okay, let's do a continuous example. So for my continuous example, I'm going to have a joint PDF, which is going to be constant over a circle of radius 1. Okay, so it has area pi, so I divide by 1 over pi, or I divide by pi, and then it just lives between x squared plus y squared less than or equal to 1. That's a plot of the range. Okay, so let's say what I want to do with this is work out the means of x and y. Okay, I could get the marginals, but I'm not even going to bother with that. I'm just going to get the means directly using the joint PDF. Okay, before we get started, this is something that you can actually just see visually from what I've given you so far. And if you want to just take a moment and think about what answer we should get, you can do that. But we're going to just go ahead and do it symbolically and see what we get. I'm going to integrate over the whole range of x times the joint PDF dx dy. And I'm going to get, um, you know, so I'm not going to try to get the marginal of x. I'm just going to use this uh, joint PDF expectation formula, treating x like a particular special function of x and y. So that means I'm going to integrate from x starting at the left side, which is minus square root 1 minus y squared, up to square root 1 minus y squared, and then y going from minus 1 to 1. Okay, and that captures this circle. I have x times 1 over pi times dx dy, and that works out to be um, an integral from minus 1 to 1 of a half x squared going from the um, circle on the left to the circle on the right. So I have minus root 1 minus y squared to root 1 minus y squared. That turns out to just be um, plugging on those terms, they get squared. So I'm left with a half 1 minus y squared minus a half 1 minus y squared. Everything's going to cancel out. Okay. And I'm going to be left with 0. And by symmetry, I can see that that's going to be the same thing that happens for e of y. Okay. So this is something that we could have seen from the joint PDF and the range plot directly, which is that it's a flat or uniform a PDF on this circle, right? And the circle is centered at zero. So I should expect that the means are going to be zero. And that's what I got from this calculation. Okay, now let's go ahead and calculate something a little bit more complicated. Um, and that's that uh, e of x, y, okay? So that's the function I'm interested in, x times y. And I know from the range that x and y are dependent. How do I know that? Well, the range is not a rectangle, it's a circle. So depending on the value of x, I restrict the value of y and vice versa. Depending on the value of y, I restrict the values of x, which leads to dependence. So um, I can't factor this generally into the product ex times ey. In this particular case, we're going to see that something interesting happens, but let's just go ahead and work our way to that. So I'm going to take this um, integral um, across the range of x and y, xy times f of xy um, dx dy. Okay, and again, I get the same limits. I'm going to go from uh, minus 1 to 1 and negative square root 1 minus y squared to square root 1 minus y squared, xy times the joint pdf, which is 1 over pi dx dy. Okay, and I'm going to end up with the same kinds of substitutions I had before. I get a half x squared ranging from minus the square root to plus the square root y times 1 over pi dy. Okay, and I can just plug in those terms. So I'm going to plug in those square roots into the square. And I'm going to get two things that look very similar, a half 1 minus y squared minus a half 1 minus y squared, because the sign, the negative sign got flipped to positive. And then I can see that these two terms will cancel and I'll have 0. And that happens to be equal to the product of ex times e of y. But x and y in this case were dependent. Okay, so the reason that I'm bringing this up is that it can happen to you that you have an example where x and y are dependent. So you're not allowed to use the general principle of expectation of products and factor the expectation of the product into the expectations of the individual terms. But it might line up anyway. And that can happen even when they're dependent. 
it doesn't mean that they're independent. So this particular example has some nice structure that causes this to work out, but it's not something that um, we got from independence because there is no independence here. Okay, let's do a different example in the same space just to see that that doesn't work in general. So I'm gonna calculate EX squared and EY squared, okay? And so I'm gonna get the same kinds of integrals. So again, they're gonna range from minus one to one and minus square root one minus y squared to square root one minus y squared, x squared, one over pi dx dy. Okay, and so I, in this case, I'm gonna get the integral to become a third x cubed, and now I'm gonna be plugging in these square root terms. And the thing to notice is since this is x cubed, the sign, the minus sign is gonna stay there. Okay, so that's the key thing to notice here. So I plug in, I'm going to get a third, one minus uh, y squared uh, to the three halves, minus minus one, see it's still there, a third, one minus y squared to the three halves, okay? One pi dy. And so I get this integral that now looks like minus one to one, two over three pi, one minus y squared raised to the three halves dy. And I'll just plug that into Wolfram Alpha or any kind of uh, symbolic integrator and get that it's a fourth. And by symmetry, the same calculation would give me ey squared. So they're both a fourth. Now let's calculate e of x squared, y squared, and see if it actually uh, factors at the end. Okay, so I do the same thing. I'm gonna write out the same integral. It's always the same uh, range limits. I'm gonna plug in x squared, uh, y squared. Okay, that's my function. There it is. And I multiply by one over pi, or I multiply by, yeah, one, one over pi, and then by computer, I'm just gonna find out that this is one over 24. That's not equal to a fourth times a fourth, which is what I would have gotten if I had EX squared times EY squared, okay? And so the point here is that X and Y are dependent, so I cannot factor the product in the expectation into individual expectations, but it sometimes does happen to work out, okay? but it won't always work out for the same PDF. So you have to be careful. That was the point of this example, that even though sometimes things are nice and they factor out, it's not always gonna work.